story two of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story two a tedious story from an old man's journal part four the summer comes and life changes one fine morning liza comes in to me and says in a joking tone come your excellency it's all ready they lead my excellency into the street put me into a cab and drive me away for want of occupation i read the signboards backwards as i go the word tavern becomes nerabat that would do for a baron's name baroness nerabat beyond i drive across the field by the cemetery which produces no impression upon me whatever though i'll soon lie there after a two hours drive my excellency is led into the ground floor of the bungalow and put into a small lively room with a light blue paper insomnia at night as before but i am no more wakeful in the morning and i don't listen to my wife but lie in bed i don't sleep but i am in a sleepy state half forgetfulness when you know you are not asleep but have dreams i get up in the afternoon and sit down at the table by force of habit but now i don't work any more but amuse myself with french yellowbacks sent me by katy of course it would be more patriotic to read russian authors but to tell the truth i'm not particularly disposed to them leaving out two or three old ones all the modern literature doesn't seem to me to be literature but a unique home industry which exists only to be encouraged but the goods are bought with reluctance the best of these homemade goods can't be called remarkable and it's impossible to praise it sincerely without a saving but and the same must be said of all the literary novelties i've read during the last ten or fifteen years not one remarkable and you can't dispense with but they have cleverness nobility and no talent talent nobility and no cleverness or finally talent cleverness but no nobility i would not say that french books have talent cleverness and nobility nor do they satisfy me but they are not so boring as the russian and it is not rare to find in them the chief constituent of creative genius the sense of personal freedom which is lacking to russian authors i do not recall one single new book in which from the very first page the author did not try to tie himself up in all manner of conventions and contracts with his conscience one is frightened to speak of the naked body another is bound hand and foot by psychological analysis a third must have a kindly attitude to his fellow-men the fourth heaps up whole pages with descriptions of nature on purpose to avoid any suspicion of a tendency one desires to be in his books a bourgeois at all costs another at all costs an aristocrat deliberation cautiousness cunning but no freedom no courage to write as one likes and therefore no creative genius all this refers to belles lettres so called as for serious articles in russian on sociology for instance or art and so forth i don't read them simply out of timidity for some reason in my childhood and youth i had a fear of porters and theatre attendants and this fear has remained with me up till now even now i am afraid of them it is said that only that which one cannot understand seems terrible and indeed it is very difficult to understand why hall porters and theatre attendants are so pompous and haughty and importantly polite when i read serious articles i have exactly the same indefinable fear their portentous gravity their playfulness like an archbishop's their over-familiar attitude to foreign authors their capacity for talking dignified nonsense filling a vacuum with emptiness it is all inconceivable to me and terrifying and quite unlike the modesty and the calm and gentlemanly tone to which i am accustomed when reading our writers on medicine and the natural sciences not only articles i have difficulty also in reading translations even when they are edited by serious russians 
the presumptuous benevolence of the prefaces the abundance of notes by the translator which prevents one from concentrating the parenthetical queries and six which are so liberally scattered over the book or the article by the translator seem to me an assault on the author's person as well as on my independence as a reader once i was invited as an expert to the high court in the interval one of my fellow experts called my attention to the rude behaviour of the public prosecutor to the prisoners among whom were two women intellectuals i don't think i exaggerated at all when i replied to my colleague that he was not behaving more rudely than authors of serious articles behave to one another indeed their behaviour is so rude that one speaks of them with bitterness they behave to each other or to the writers whom they criticise either with too much deference careless of their own dignity or on the other hand they treat them much worse than i have treated necker my future son-in-law in these notes and thoughts of mine accusations of irresponsibility of impure intentions of any kind of crime even are the usual adornment of serious articles and this as our young medicos love to say in their little articles quite ultima ratio such an attitude must necessarily be reflected in the character of the young generation of writers and therefore i am not at all surprised that in the new books which have been added to our belles lettres in the last ten or fifteen years the heroes drink a great deal of vodka and the heroines are not sufficiently chaste i read french books and look out of the window which is open i see the pointed palings of my little garden two or three skinny trees and there beyond the garden the road fields then a wide strip of young pine forest i often delight in watching a little boy and girl both white-haired and ragged climb on the garden fence and laugh at my baldness in their shining little eyes i read come out thou bald head these are almost the only people who don't care a bit about my reputation or my title i don't have visitors every day now i'll mention only the visits of nicholas and pyotr ignatievich nicholas comes to me usually on holidays pretending to come on business but really to see me he is very hilarious a thing which never happens to him in the winter well what have you got to say i ask him coming out into the passage your excellency he says pressing my hand to his heart and looking at me with a lover's rapture your excellency so help me god god strike me where i stand gaudiamus igitur juvenistus and he kisses me eagerly on the shoulders on my sleeves and buttons is everything all right over there i ask your excellency i swear to god he never stops swearing quite unnecessarily and i soon get bored and send him to the kitchen where they give him dinner pyotr ignatievich also comes on holidays specially to visit me and communicate his thoughts to me he usually sits by the table in my room modest clean judicious without daring to cross his legs or lean his elbows on the table all the while telling me in a quiet even voice what he considers very piquant items of news gathered from journals and pamphlets these items are all alike and can be reduced to the following type a frenchman made a discovery another a german exposed him by showing that this discovery had been made as long ago as eighteen seventy by some american then a third also a german outwitted them both by showing that both of them had been confused by taking spherules of air under a microscope for dark pigment even when he wants to make me laugh pyotr ignatievich tells his story at great length very much as though he were defending a thesis enumerating his literary sources in detail with every effort to avoid mistakes in the dates the particular number of the journal and the names moreover he does not say pettit simply but inevitably jean jacques pettit if he happens to stay to dinner he will tell the same sort of piquant stories and drive all the company to despondency 
if necker and liza begin to speak of fugues and counterfugues in his presence he modestly lowers his eyes and his face falls he is ashamed that such triviality should be spoken of in the presence of such serious men as him and me in my present state of mind five minutes are enough for him to bore me as though i had seen and listened to him for a whole eternity i hate the poor man i wither away beneath his quiet even voice and his bookish language his stories make me stupid he cherishes the kindliest feelings toward me and talks to me only to give me pleasure i reward him by staring at his face as if i wanted to hypnotize him and thinking go away go go but he is proof against my mental suggestion and sits 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 while he sits with me i cannot rid myself of the idea when i die it's quite possible that he will be appointed in my place then my poor audience appears to me as an oasis where the stream has dried up and i am unkind to pietr ignatievich and silent and morose as if he were guilty of such thoughts and not i myself when he begins as usual to glorify the german scholars i no longer jest good-naturedly but murmur sternly they're fools your germans it's like the late professor nikita krylov when he was bathing with pirogov at revel he got angry with the water which was very cold and swore about those scoundrelly germans i behave badly to pietr ignatievich and it's only when he is going away and i see through the window his grey hat disappearing behind the garden fence that i want to call him back and say forgive me my dear fellow the dinner goes yet more wearily than in winter the same necker whom i now hate and despise dines with me every day before i used to suffer his presence in silence but now i say biting things to him which makes my wife and liza blush carried away by an evil feeling i often say things that are merely foolish and don't know why i say them thus it happened once that after looking at necker contemptuously for a long while i suddenly fired off for no reason at all eagles than barnyard fowls may lower bend but fowl shall never to the heavens ascend more's the pity that the foul necker shows himself more clever than the eagle professor knowing my wife and daughter are on his side he maintains these tactics he replies to my shafts with a condescending silence ah, the old man off his head what's the good of talking to him or makes good-humoured fun of me it is amazing to what depths of pettiness a man may descend during the whole dinner i can dream how necker will be shown to be an adventurer how liza and my wife will realize their mistake and i will tease them ridiculous dreams like these at a time when i have one foot in the grave now there occur misunderstandings of a kind which i formerly knew only by hearsay though it is painful i will describe one which occurred after dinner the other day i sit in my room smoking a little pipe enters my wife as usual sits down and begins to talk what a good idea it would be to go to kharkov now while the weather is warm and there is the time and inquire what kind of man our necker is very well i'll go i agree my wife gets up pleased with me and walks to the door but immediately returns by the by i've one more favour to ask i know you'll be angry but it's my duty to warn you forgive me nikolai but all our neighbours have begun to talk about the way you go to katie's continually i don't deny that she's clever and educated it's pleasant to spend the time with her but at your age and in your position it's rather strange to find pleasure in her society besides she has a reputation enough to all my blood rushes instantly from my brain my eyes flash fire i catch hold of my hair and stamp and cry in a voice that is not mine leave me alone leave me leave me 
my face is probably terrible and my voice strange for my wife suddenly gets pale and calls aloud with a despairing voice also not her own at our cries rush in liza and necker and then yegor my feet grow numb as though they did not exist i feel that i am falling into somebody's arms then i hear crying for a little while and sink into a faint which lasts for two or three hours now for katie she comes to see me before evening every day which of course must be noticed by my neighbours and my friends after a minute she takes me with her for a drive she has her own horse and a new buggy she bought this summer generally she lives like a princess she has taken an expensive detached bungalow with a big garden and put into it all her town furniture she has two maids and a coachman i often ask her katie what will you live on when you spent all your father's money well, we'll see then she answers but this money deserves to be treated more seriously my dear it was earned by a good man and honest labour ah oh, you've told me that before i know first we drive by the field then by a young pine forest which you can see from my window nature seems to me as beautiful as she used although the devil whispers to me that all these pines and firs the birds and white clouds in the sky will not notice my absence in three or four months when i am dead katie likes to take the reins and it is good that the weather is fine and i am sitting by her side she is in a happy mood and does not say bitter things you're a very good man nikolai she says you are a rare bird there's no actor who could play your part mine or mikhail's for instance even a bad actor could manage but yours there's nobody i envy you envy you terribly i what am i what she thinks for a moment and asks i'm a negative phenomenon aren't i yes i answer hmm what's to be done then what answer can i give it's easy to say work or give your property to the poor or know yourself and because it's so easy to say this i don't know what to answer my therapeutist colleagues when teaching methods of cure advise one to individualize each particular case this advice must be followed in order to convince oneself that the remedies recommended in the textbooks as the best and most thoroughly suitable as a general rule are quite unsuitable in particular cases it applies to moral affections as well but i must answer something so i say you've too much time on your hands my dear you must take up something in fact why shouldn't you go on the stage again if you have a vocation i can't you have the manner and tone of a victim i don't like it my dear you have yourself to blame remember you began by getting angry with people and things in general but you never did anything to improve either of them you didn't put up a struggle against the evil you got tired you're not a victim of the struggle but of your own weakness certainly you were young then and inexperienced but now everything can be different come on be an actress you will work you will serve in the temple of art oh don't be so clever nikolai she interrupts let's agree once for all let's speak about actors actresses writers but let us leave art out of it you're a rare and excellent man but you don't understand enough about art to consider it truly sacred you have no flair no ear for art you've been busy all your life and you never had time to acquire the flair really i don't love these conversations about art she continues nervously i don't love them they've vulgarized it enough already thank you who's vulgarized it they vulgarized it by their drunkenness newspapers by their overfamiliarity, clever people by philosophy what's philosophy got to do with it a great deal if a man philosophizes it means he doesn't understand so that it should not come to bitter words i hasten to change the subject and then keep silence for a long while it's not till we come out of the forest and drive towards katie's bungalow i return to the subject and ask still you haven't answered me why you don't want to go on the stage 
really it's cruel she cries out and suddenly blushes all over you want me to tell you the truth outright very well if 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 you will have it i've no talent no talent and much ambition there you are after this confession she turns her face away from me and to hide the trembling of her hands tugs at the reins as we approach her bungalow from a distance we see mikhail already walking about by the gate impatiently awaiting us this fyodorovitch again katy says with annoyance please take him away from me i'm sick of him he's flat let him go to the deuce mikhail fyodorovitch ought to have gone abroad long ago but he has postponed his departure every week there have been some changes in him lately he's suddenly got thin begun to be affected by drink a thing that never happened to him before and his black eyebrows have begun to get grey when our buggy stops at the gate he cannot hide his joy and impatience anxiously he helps katy and me from the buggy hastily asks us questions laughs slowly rubs his hands and that gentle prayerful pure something that i used to notice only in his eyes is now poured all over his face he is happy and at the same time ashamed of his happiness ashamed of his habit of coming to katy's every evening and he finds it necessary to give a reason for his coming some obvious absurdity like oh, i was passing on business and i thought i'd just drop in for a second all three of us go indoors first we drink tea then our old friends the two packs of cards appear on the table with a big piece of cheese some fruit and a bottle of crimean champagne the subjects of conversation are not new but all exactly the same as they were in the winter the university the students literature the theatre all of them come in for it the air thickens with slanders and grows more close it is poisoned by the breath not of two toads as in winter but now by all three besides the velvety baritone laughter and the accordion-like giggle the maid who waits upon us hears also the unpleasant jarring laugh of a musical comedy general <laughs> end of story two part four Story two of The Bet and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two A Tedious Story from an Old Man's Journal, Part five. There sometimes come fearful nights with thunder, lightning, rain, and wind, which the peasants call sparrow nights. There was one such sparrow night in my own personal life i wake after midnight and suddenly leap out of bed somehow it seems to me that i am going to die immediately i do not know why for there is no single sensation in my body which points to a quick end but a terror presses on my soul as though i had suddenly seen a huge ill-boding fire in the sky i light the lamp quickly and drink some water straight out of the decanter then i hurry to the window the weather is magnificent the air smells of hay and some delicious thing besides i see the spikes of my garden fence the sleepy starveling trees by the window the road the dark strip of forest there is a calm and brilliant moon in the sky and not a single cloud serenity not a leaf stirs to me it seems that everything is looking at me and listening for me to die dread seizes me i shut the window and run to the bed i feel for my pulse i cannot find it in my wrist i seek it in my temples my chin my hand again they are all cold and slippery with sweat my breathing comes quicker and quicker my body trembles all my bowels are stirred and my face and forehead feel as though a cobweb had settled on them what shall i do shall i call my family no use i do not know what my wife and liza will do when they come in to me i hide my head under the pillow shut my eyes and wait wait my spine is cold it almost contracts within me and i feel that death will approach me only from behind very quietly kivi kivi 
a squeak sounds in the stillness of the night i do not know whether it is in my heart or in the street god how awful i would drink some more water but now i dread opening my eyes and fear to raise my head the terror is unaccountable animal i cannot understand why i am afraid is it because i want to live or because a new and unknown pain awaits me upstairs above the ceiling a moan then a laugh i listen a little after steps sound on the staircase some one hurries down then up again in a minute steps sound downstairs again some one stops by my door and listens who's there i call the door opens i open my eyes boldly and see my wife her face is pale and her eyes red with weeping you're not asleep nikolai stepanovich she says what is it for god's sake go down to liza something is wrong with her very well with pleasure i murmur very glad that i am not alone very well immediately as i follow my wife i hear what she tells me and from agitation understand not a word bright spots from her candle dance over the steps of the stairs our long shadows tremble my feet catch in the skirts of my dressing-gown my breath goes and it seems to me that some one is chasing me trying to seize my back i shall die here on the staircase this second i think this second but we have passed the staircase the dark hall with the italian window and we go into liza's room she sits in bed in her chemise her bare legs hang down and she moans oh my god oh my god she murmurs half shutting her eyes from her candles i can't i can't liza my child i say what's the matter seeing me she calls out and falls on my neck papa darling she sobs papa dearest my sweet i don't know what it is it, it, it hurts she embraces me kisses me and lisps endearments which i heard her lisp when she was still a baby be calm my child god's with you i say you mustn't cry something hurts me too i try to cover her with the bedclothes my wife gives her to drink and both of us jostle in confusion round the bed my shoulders push into hers and at that moment i remember how we used to bathe our children but help her help her my wife implores do something and what can i do nothing there is some weight on the girl's soul but i understand nothing know nothing and can only murmur it's nothing um, nothing it, it will pass uh, sleep sleep as if on purpose a dog suddenly howls in the yard at first low and irresolute then loud in two voices i never put any value on such signs as dogs whining or screeching owls but now my heart contracts painfully and i hasten to explain the howling nonsense i think it's the influence of one organism on another my great nervous strain was transmitted to my wife to liza and to the dog that's all such transmissions explain presentiments and previsions a little later when i return to my room to write a prescription for liza i no longer think that i shall die soon my soul simply feels heavy and dull so that i am even sad that i did not die suddenly for a long while i stand motionless in the middle of the room pondering what i shall prescribe for liza but the moans above the ceiling are silent and i decide not to write a prescription but stand there still there is a dead silence a silence as one man wrote that rings in one's ears the time goes slowly the bars of moonlight on the window-sill do not move from their place as though congealed the dawn is still far away but the garden gate creaks some one steals in and strips a twig from the starveling trees and cautiously knocks with it on my window nikolai stepanovich i hear a whisper nikolai stepanovich i open the window and i think that i am dreaming under the window close against the wall stands a woman in a blade dress 
she is brightly lighted by the moon and looks at me with wide eyes her face is pale stern and fantastic in the moon like marble her chin trembles it is i she says i katie in the moon all women's eyes are big and black people are taller and paler probably that is the reason why i did not recognize her in the first moment what's the matter forgive me she says i suddenly felt so dreary i could not bear it so i came here there's a light in your window and i decided to knock forgive me oh if you knew how dreary i felt what are you doing now nothing insomnia her eyebrows lift her eyes shine with tears and all her face is illumined as with light with the familiar but long unseen look of confidence nikolai stepanovitch she says imploringly stretching out both her hands to me dear i beg you i implore if you do not despise my friendship and my respect for you then do what i implore you what is it take my money what next what's the good of your money to me you will go somewhere to be cured you must cure yourself you will take it yes dear yes she looks into my face eagerly and repeats yes you will take it no my dear i won't take it i say thank you she turns her back to me and lowers her head probably the tone of my refusal would not allow any further talk of money go home to sleep i say i'll see you to-morrow it means you don't consider me your friend she asks sadly i don't say that but your money is no good to me forgive me she says lowering her voice by a full octave i understand you to be obliged to a person like me a retired actress but good-bye and she walks away so quickly that i have no time even to say good-bye part six i am in kharkov since it would be useless to fight against my present mood and i have no power to do it i made up my mind that the last days of my life shall be irreproachable on the formal side if i am not right with my family which i certainly admit i will try at least to do as it wishes besides i am lately become so indifferent that it's positively all the same to me whether i go to kharkov or paris or Birdyshev i arrived here at noon and put up at a hotel not far from the cathedral the train made me giddy the draughts blew through me and now i am sitting on the bed with my head in my hands waiting for the tick i ought to go to my professor friends to-day but i have neither the will nor the strength the old hall porter comes in to ask whether i have brought my own bedclothes i keep him about five minutes asking him questions about necker on whose account i came here the porter happens to be kharkov born and knows the town inside out but he doesn't remember any family with the name of necker i inquire about the estate the answer is the same the clock in the passage strikes one two three the last months of my life while i wait for death seems to me far longer than my whole life never before could i reconcile myself to the slowness of time as i can now before when i had to wait for a train at the station or to sit at an examination a quarter of an hour would seem an eternity now i can sit motionless in bed the whole night long quite calmly thinking that there will be the same long colourless night to-morrow and the next day in the passage the clock strikes five six seven it grows dark there is dull pain in my cheek the beginning of the tick to occupy myself with thoughts i return to my old point of view when i was not indifferent and ask why do i a famous man a privy councillor sit in this little room on this bed with a strange grey blanket why do i look at this cheap tin washstand and listen to the wretched clock jarring in the passage is all this worthy of my fame and my high position among people and i answer these questions with a smile 
my naivete seems funny to me the naivete with which as a young man i exaggerated the value of fame and of the exclusive position which famous men enjoy i am famous my name is spoken with reverence my portrait has appeared in niva and in the universal illustration i've even read my biography in a german paper but what of that i sit lonely by myself in a strange city on a strange bed rubbing my aching cheek with my palm family scandals the hardness of creditors the rudeness of railway men the discomforts of the passport system the expensive and unwholesome food at the buffets the general coarseness and roughness of people all this and a great deal more that would take too long to put down concerns me as much as it concerns any bourgeois who is known only in his own little street where is the exclusiveness of my position then we will admit that i am infinitely famous that i am a hero of whom my country is proud all the newspapers give bulletins of my illness the post is already bringing in sympathetic addresses from my friends my pupils and the public but all this will not save me from dying in anguish on a stranger's bed in utter loneliness of course there is no one to blame for this but i must confess that i do not like my popularity i feel that it has deceived me at about ten i fall asleep and in spite of the tick sleep soundly and would sleep for a long while were i not awakened just after one there is a sudden knock on my door who's there a telegram you could have brought it in to-morrow i storm as i take the telegram from the porter now i shan't sleep again i'm sorry there was a light in your room i thought you were not asleep i open the telegram and look first at the signature my wife's what does she want necker married eliza secretly yesterday return i read the telegram for a long while i am not startled not necker's nor liza's action frightens me but the indifference with which i receive the news of their marriage men say that philosophers and true savants are indifferent it is untrue indifference is the paralysis of the soul premature death i go to bed again and begin to ponder with what thoughts i can occupy myself what on earth shall i think of i seem to have thought over everything and now there is nothing powerful enough to rouse my thought when the day begins to dawn i sit in bed clasping my knees and for want of occupation i try to know myself know yourself is good useful advice but it is a pity that the ancients did not think of showing us the way to avail ourselves of it before when i had the desire to understand somebody else or myself i used not to take into consideration actions wherein everything is conditional but desires tell me what you want and i will tell you what you are and now i examine myself what do i want i want our wives children friends and pupils to love in us not the name or the firm or the label but the ordinary human beings what besides i should like to have assistants and successors what more i should like to wake in a hundred years time and take a look if only with one eye at what has happened to science i should like to live ten years more what further nothing further i think think a long while and cannot make out anything else however much i were to think wherever my thoughts should stray it is clear to me that the chief all-important something is lacking in my desires in my infatuation for science my desire to live my sitting here on a strange bed my yearning to know myself in all the thoughts feelings and ideas i form about anything there is wanting the something universal which could bind all these together in one whole 
each feeling and thought lives detached in me and in all my opinions about science the theatre literature and my pupils and in all the little pictures which my imagination paints not even the most cunning analyst will discover what is called the general idea or the god of the living man and if this is not there then nothing is there in poverty such as this a serious infirmity fear of death influence of circumstances and people would have been enough to overthrow and shatter all that i formerly considered as my conception of the world and all wherein i saw the meaning and joy of my life therefore it is nothing strange that i have darkened the last months of my life by thoughts and feelings worthy of a slave or a savage and that i am now indifferent and do not notice the dawn if there is lacking in a man that which is higher and stronger than all outside influences then verily a good cold in the head is enough to upset his balance and to make him see each bird an owl and hear a dog's whine in every sound and all this pessimism or his optimism with their attendant thoughts great and small seem then to be merely symptoms and no more i am beaten then it is no good going on thinking no good talking i shall sit and wait in silence for what will come in the morning the porter brings me tea and the local paper mechanically i read the advertisements on the first page the leader the extracts from newspapers and magazines the local news among other things i find in the local news an item like this our famous scholar emeritus professor nikolai stepanovich arrived in kharkov yesterday by the express and stayed at blank hotel evidently big names are created to live detached from those who bear them now my name walks in kharkov undisturbed in some three months it will shine as bright as the sun itself inscribed in letters of gold on my tombstone at a time when i myself will be under the sod a faint knock at the door somebody wants me who's there come in the door opens i step back in astonishment and hasten to pull my dressing-gown together before me stands katie how do you do she says panting from running up the stairs you didn't expect me i've come too she sits down and continues stammering and looking away from me why don't you say good morning i arrived too to-day i found out you were at this hotel and came to see you well, i'm delighted to see you i say shrugging my shoulders but i'm surprised you might have dropped straight from heaven what are you doing here i i just came silence suddenly she gets up impetuously and comes over to me nikolai stepanovich she says growing pale and pressing her hands to her breast nikolai stepanovich i can't go on like this any longer i can't for god's sake tell me now immediately what shall i do tell me what shall i do what can i say i am beaten i can say nothing but tell me i implore you she continues out of breath and trembling all over her body i swear to you i can't go on like this any longer i haven't the strength she drops into a chair and begins to sob she throws her head back wrings her hands stamps with her feet her hat falls from her head and dangles by its string her hair is loosened help me help she implores i can't bear it any more she takes a handkerchief out of her little travelling bag and with it pulls out some letters which fall from her knees to the floor i pick them up from the floor and recognize on one of them mikhail fyodorovich's handwriting and accidentally read part of a word passionate there's nothing that i can say to you katie i say help me she sobs seizing my hand and kissing it you're my father my only friend you're wise and learned and you've lived long you were a teacher tell me what to do i am bewildered and surprised stirred by her sobbing and i can hardly stand upright let's have some breakfast katie i say with a constrained smile 
instantly i add in a sinking voice i shall be dead soon katie only one word only one word she weeps and stretches out her hands to me what shall i do you're a queer thing really i murmur i can't understand it such a clever woman and suddenly weeping come silence katie arranges her hair puts on her hat then crumples her letters and stuffs them in her little bag all in silence and unhurried her face her bosom and her gloves are wet with tears but her expression is dry already stern i look at her and am ashamed that i am happier than she it was but a little while before my death in the ebb of my life that i noticed in myself the absence of what our friends the philosophers call the general idea but this poor thing's soul has never known and never will know shelter all her life all her life katie let's have breakfast i say no thank you she answers coldly one minute more passes in silence i don't like kharkov i say it's too grey a grey city yes ugly i'm not here for long on my way i leave to-day for where for the crimea i mean the caucasus so for long i don't know katie gets up and gives me her hand with a cold smile looking away from me i would like to ask her that means you won't be at my funeral but she does not look at me her hand is cold and like a stranger's i escort her to the door in silence she goes out of my room and walks down the long passage without looking back she knows that my eyes are following her and probably on the landing she will look back no she did not look back the black dress showed for the last time her steps were stilled good-bye my treasure end of story two story three of the bet and other stories by anton chekhov this librivox recording is in the public domain story three the fit part one the medical student meyer and ribnikov a student at the moscow school of painting sculpture and architecture came one evening to their friend vasiliev law student and proposed that he should go with them to s street for a long while vasiliev did not agree but eventually dressed himself and went with them unfortunate women he knew only by hearsay and from books and never once in his life had he been in the houses where they live he knew there were immoral women who were forced by the pressure of disastrous circumstances environment bad upbringing poverty and the like to sell their honour for money they do not know pure love have no children and no legal rights mothers and sisters mourn them for dead science treats them as an evil men are familiar with them but notwithstanding all this they do not lose the image and likeness of god they all acknowledge their sin and hope for salvation they are free to avail themselves of every means of salvation true society does not forgive people their past but with god mary of egypt is not lower than the other saints whenever vasiliev recognized an unfortunate woman in the street by her costume or her manner or saw a picture of one in a comic paper there came into his mind every time a story he once read somewhere a pure and heroic young man falls in love with an unfortunate woman and asks her to be his wife but she considering herself unworthy of such happiness poisons herself vasiliev lived in one of the streets off the sverskoy boulevard when he and his friends came out of the house it was about eleven o'clock the first snow had just fallen and all nature was under the spell of this new snow the air smelt of snow the snow cracked softly underfoot the earth the roofs the trees the benches on the boulevards all were soft white and young owing to this the houses had a different look from yesterday the lamps burned brighter the air was more transparent the clatter of the cabs was dulled and there entered into the soul with the fresh easy frosty air a feeling like the white young feathery snow 
to these sad shores unknowing the medico began to sing in a pleasant tenor an unknown power entices behold the mill the painter's voice took him up it is now fallen to ruin behold the mill it is now fallen to ruin the medico repeated raising his eyebrows and sadly shaking his head he was silent for a while passed his hand over his forehead trying to recall the words and began to sing in a loud voice and so well that the passers-by looked back here long ago came free free love to me all three went into a restaurant and without taking off their coats they each had two thimblefuls of vodka at the bar before drinking the second vassiliev noticed a piece of cork in his vodka lifted the glass to his eye looked at it for a long while with a short-sighted frown the medico misunderstood his expression and said well what are you staring at no philosophy please vodka's made to be drunk caviar to be eaten women to sleep with snow to walk on live like a man for one evening well i've nothing to say said vassiliev laughingly i'm not refusing the vodka warmed his breast he looked at his friends admired and envied them how balanced everything is in these healthy strong cheerful people everything in their minds and souls is smooth and rounded off they sing have a passion for the theatre paint talk continually and drink and they never have a headache the next day they are romantic and dissolute sentimental and insolent they can work and go on the loose and laugh at nothing and talk rubbish they are hot-headed honest heroic and as human beings not a bit worse than vassiliev who watches his every step and word who is a careful cautious and able to give the smallest trifle the dignity of a problem and he made up his mind if only for one evening to live like his friends to let himself go and be free from his own control must he drink vodka he'll drink even if his head falls to pieces to-morrow must he be taken to women he'll go he'll laugh play the fool and give a joking answer to disapproving passers-by he came out of the restaurant laughing he liked his friends one in a battered hat with a wide brim who aped aesthetic disorder the other in a sealskin cap not very poor with a pretense of learned bohemia he liked the snow the paleness the lamplights the dear black prints which the passers feet left on the snow he liked the air and above all the transparent tender naive virgin tone which can be seen in nature only twice in the year when everything is covered in snow on the bright days in spring and on moonlight nights when the ice breaks on the river to these sad shores unknowing he began to sing sotto voce an unknown power entices and all the way for some reason or other he and his friends had this melody on their lips all three hummed it mechanically out of time with each other vassiliev imagined how in about ten minutes he and his friends would knock at a door how they would stealthily walk through the narrow little passages and dark rooms to the women how he would take advantage of the dark suddenly strike a match and see lit up a suffering face and a guilty smile there he will surely find a fair or a dark woman in a white nightgown with her hair loose she will be frightened of the light dreadfully confused and say good god what are you doing blow it out all this was frightening but curious and novel part two the friends turned out of trubnoi square into the gratovka and soon arrived at the street which vassiliev knew only from hearsay seeing two rows of houses with brightly lighted windows and wide open doors and hearing the gay sound of pianos and fiddles sounds which flew out of all the doors and mingled in a strange confusion as if somewhere in the darkness over the rooftops an unseen orchestra were tuning vassiliev was bewildered and said what a lot of houses what's that said the medico there are ten times as many in london there are a hundred thousand of these women there the cabmen sat on their boxes quiet and indifferent as in other streets on the pavement walked the same passers-by 
no one was in a hurry no one hid his face in his collar no one shook his head reproachfully and in this indifference in the confused sound of the pianos and fiddles in the bright windows and wide open doors something very free impudent bold and daring could be felt it must have been the same as this in the old times on the slave markets as gay and as noisy people looked and walked with the same indifference let's begin right at the beginning said the painter the friends walked into a narrow little passage lighted by a single lamp with a reflector when they opened the door a man in a black jacket rose lazily from the yellow sofa in the hall he had an unshaven lackey's face and sleepy eyes the place smelt like a laundry and of vinegar from the hall a door led into a brightly lighted room the medico and the painter stopped in the doorway stretched out their necks and peeped into the room together bona sera signor rigoletto huguenot traviata the painter began making a theatrical bow a bona black beetle on a pistoletto said the medico pressing his hat to his heart and bowing low vassiliev kept behind them he wanted to bow theatrically too and say something silly but he only smiled felt awkward and ashamed and awaited impatiently what was to follow in the door appeared a little fair girl of seventeen or eighteen with short hair wearing a short blue dress with a white bow on her breast what are you standing in the door for she said take off your overcoats and come into the salon the medico and the painter went into the salon still speaking italian vassiliev followed them irresolutely gentlemen take off your overcoats said the lackey stiffly you're not allowed in as you are besides the fair girl there was another woman in the salon very stout and tall with a foreign face and bare arms she sat by the piano with a game of patience spread on her knees she took no notice of the guests where are the other girls asked the medico they're drinking tea said the fair one stepan she called out go and tell the girls some students have come a little later a third girl entered in a bright red dress with blue stripes her face was thickly and unskilfully painted her forehead was hidden under her hair she stared with dull frightened eyes as she came she immediately began to sing in a strong hoarse contralto after her a fourth girl after her a fifth in all this vassiliev saw nothing new or curious it seemed to him that he had seen before and more than once this salon piano cheap gilt mirror the white bow the dress with blue stripes and the stupid indifferent faces but of darkness quiet mystery and guilty smile of all he had expected to meet here and which frightened him he did not see even a shadow everything was commonplace prosaic and dull only one thing provoked his curiosity a little that was the terrible as it were intentional lack of taste which was seen in the overmantels the absurd pictures the dresses and the white bow in this lack of taste there was something characteristic and singular how poor and foolish it all is thought vassiliev what is there in all this rubbish to tempt a normal man to provoke him into committing a frightful sin to buy a living soul for a rouble i can understand any one sinning for the sake of splendour beauty grace passion but what is there here what tempts people here but it's no good thinking whiskers stand me champagne the fair one turned to him vassiliev suddenly blushed with pleasure he said bowing politely but excuse me if i i don't drink with you i don't drink five minutes after the friends were off to another house why did you order drinks stormed the medico what a millionaire flinging six roubles into the gutter like that for nothing at all why shouldn't i give her pleasure if she wants it said vassiliev justifying himself you didn't give her any pleasure madame got that it's madame who tells them to ask the guests for drinks she makes by it 
behold the mill the painter began to sing now fallen to ruin when they came to another house the friends stood outside in the vestibule but did not enter the salon as in the first house a figure rose up from the sofa in the hall in a black jacket with a sleepy lackey's face as he looked at this lackey at his face and shabby jacket vassiliev thought what must an ordinary simple russian go through before fate casts him up here where was he before and what was he doing what awaits him is he married where's his mother and does she know he's a lackey here thenceforward in every house vassiliev involuntarily turned his attention to the lackey first of all in one of the houses it seemed to be the fourth the lackey was a dry little puny fellow with a chain across his waistcoat he was reading a newspaper and took no notice of the guests at all glancing at his face vassiliev had the idea that a fellow with a face like that could steal and murder and perjure and indeed the face was interesting a big forehead grey eyes a flat little nose small close-set teeth and the expression on his face dull and impudent at once like a puppy hard on a hare vassiliev had the thought that he would like to touch this lackey's hair is it rough or soft oh, it must be rough like a dog's part three because he had had two glasses the painter suddenly got rather drunk and unnaturally lively let's go to another place he added waving his hands i'll introduce you to the best when he had taken his friends into the house which was according to him the best he proclaimed a persistent desire to dance a quadrille the medico began to grumble that they would have to pay the musicians a rouble but agreed to be his vis-a-vis -vis. the dance began it was just as bad in the best house as in the worst just the same mirrors and pictures were there the same coiffures and dresses looking round at the furniture and the costumes vassiliev now understood that it was not lack of taste but something that might be called the particular taste and style of s street quite impossible to find anywhere else something complete not accidental evolved in time after he had been to eight houses he no longer wondered at the colour of the dresses or the long trains or at the bright bows or the sailor dresses or the thick violent painting of the cheeks he understood that all this was in harmony that if only one woman dressed herself humanly or one decent print hung on the wall then the general tone of the whole street would suffer how badly they manage the business can't they really understand that vice is only fascinating when it is beautiful and secret hidden under the cloak of virtue modest black dresses pale faces sad smiles and darkness act more strongly than this clumsy tinsel idiots if they don't understand it themselves their guests ought to teach them a girl in a polish costume trimmed with white fur came up close to him and sat down by his side why don't you dance my brown-haired darling she asked what do you feel so bored about because it is boring stand me a chateau lafitte then you won't be bored vassiliev made no answer for a little while he was silent and then he asked what time do you go to bed as a rule six when do you get up well, sometimes two sometimes three and after you get up what do you do we drink coffee we have dinner at seven and uh, what do you have for dinner soup or she as a rule beefsteak dessert our madame keeps the girls well but what are you asking all this for oh, just to have a talk vassiliev wanted to ask about all sorts of things he had a strong desire to find out where she came from were her parents alive and did they know she was here how she got into the house was she happy and contented or gloomy and depressed with dark thoughts does she ever hope to escape but he could not possibly think how to begin or how to put his questions without seeming indiscreet he thought for a long while and asked how old are you eighty joked the girl looking and laughing at the tricks the painter was doing with his hands and feet 
she suddenly giggled and uttered a long filthy expression aloud so that every one could hear vassiliev terrified not knowing how to look began to laugh uneasily he alone smiled all the others his friends the musicians and the women paid no attention to his neighbour they might never have heard stand me a lafitte said the girl again vassiliev was suddenly repelled by her white trimming and her voice and left her it seemed to him close and hot his heart began to beat slowly and violently like a hammer one two three let's get out of here he said pulling the painter's sleeve wait let's finish it while the medico and the painter were finishing their quadrille vassiliev in order to avoid the women eyed the musicians the pianist was a nice old man with spectacles with a face like marshal basson the fiddler a young man with a short fair beard dressed in the latest fashion the young man was not stupid or starved on the contrary he looked clever young and fresh he was dressed with a touch of originality and played with emotion problem how did he and the decent old man get here why aren't they ashamed to sit here what do they think about when they look at the women if the piano and the fiddle were played by ragged hungry gloomy drunken creatures with thin stupid faces then their presence would perhaps be intelligible as it was vassiliev could understand nothing into his memory came the story that he had read about the unfortunate woman and how he found that the human figure with the guilty smile had nothing to do with this it seemed to him that they were not unfortunate women that he saw but they belonged to another utterly different world foreign and inconceivable to him if he had seen this world on the stage or read about it in a book he would never have believed it the girl with the white trimming giggled again and said something disgusting aloud he felt sick blushed and went out wait we're coming too cried the painter part four i had a talk with my mamselle while we were dancing said the medico when all three came into the street the subject was her first love he was a bookkeeper in smolensk with a wife and five children she was seventeen and lived with her pa and ma who kept a soap and candle shop how did he conquer her heart asked vassiliev he bought her fifty roubles worth of underclothes lord knows what however could he get her love story out of his girl thought vassiliev i can't my dear chaps i'm off home he said why because i don't know how to get on here i'm bored and disgusted what is there amusing about it if they were only human beings but they're savages and beasts i'm going please grisha darling please the painter said with a sob in his voice pressing close to vassiliev let's go to one more then to hell with them do come grigor they prevailed on vassiliev and led him to a staircase the carpet and the gilded balustrade the porter who opened the door the panels which decorated the hall were still in the same s street style but here it was perfected and imposing really i'm going home said vassiliev taking off his overcoat darling please please said the painter and kissed him on the neck don't be so fatty grigory be a pal together we came together we go what a beast you are though i can wait for you in the street my god it's disgusting here please please you just look on see just look on one should look on things objectively said the medico seriously vassiliev entered the salon and sat down there were many more guests besides him and his friends two infantry officers a grey bald-headed gentleman with gold spectacles two young clean-shaven men from the surveyors institute and a very drunk man with an actor's face all the girls were looking after these guests and took no notice of vassiliev only one of them dressed like aida glanced at him sideways smiled at something and said with a yawn ah so the dark ones come vassiliev's heart was beating and his face was burning he felt ashamed for being there disgusted and tormented 
he was tortured by the thought that he a decent and affectionate man so he considered himself up till now despised these women and felt nothing towards them but repulsion he could not feel pity for them or for the musicians or the lackeys it's because i don't try to understand them he thought they're all more like beasts than human beings but all the same they are human beings they've got souls one should understand them first then judge them grisha don't go away wait for us called the painter and he disappeared somewhere soon the medico disappeared also yes one should try to understand it's no good otherwise thought vassiliev and he began to examine intently the face of each girl looking for the guilty smile but whether he could not read faces or because none of these women felt guilty he saw in each face only a dull look of common vulgar boredom and satiety stupid eyes stupid smiles harsh stupid voices impudent gestures and nothing else evidently every woman had in her past a love romance with a bookkeeper and fifty roubles worth of underclothes and in the present the only good things in life were coffee a three-course dinner wine quadrilles and sleeping till two in the afternoon finding not one guilty smile vassiliev began to examine them to see if even one looked clever and his attention was arrested by one pale rather tired face it was that of a dark woman no longer young wearing a dress scattered with spangles she sat in a chair staring at the floor and thinking of something vassiliev paced up and down and then sat down beside her as if by accident one must begin with something trivial he thought and gradually pass on to serious conversation what a beautiful little dress you have on he said and touched the gold fringe of her scarf with his finger it's all right said the dark woman where do you come from i a long way from chernigov it's a nice part it always is where you don't happen to be what a pity i can't describe nature thought vassiliev i'd move her by descriptions of chernigov she must love it if she was born there do you feel lonely here he asked of course i'm lonely why don't you go away from here if you're lonely where shall i go to start begging eh? it's easier to beg than to live here where did you get that idea have you been a beggar i begged when i hadn't enough to pay my university fees and even if i hadn't begged it's easy enough to understand a beggar is a free man at any rate and you're a slave the dark woman stretched herself and followed with sleepy eyes the lackey who carried a tray of glasses and soda water stand us a champagne she said and yawned again champagne said vassiliev what would happen if your mother or your brother suddenly came in what would you say and what would they say you would say champagne then suddenly the noise of crying was heard from the next room where the lackey had carried the soda water a fair man rushed out with a red face and angry eyes he was followed by the tall stout madam who screamed in a squeaky voice no one gave you permission to slap the girls in the face better class than you come here and never slap a girl you bounder followed an uproar vassiliev was scared and went white in the next room some one wept sobbing sincerely as only the insulted weep and he understood that indeed human beings lived here actually human beings who get offended suffer weep and ask for help the smouldering hatred the feeling of repulsion gave way to an acute sense of pity and anger against the wrongdoer he rushed into the room from which the weeping came through the rows of bottles which stood on the marble table-top he saw a suffering tear-stained face stretched out his hands towards this face stepped to the table and instantly gave a leap back in terror the sobbing woman was dead drunk as he made his way through the noisy crowd gathered round the fair man his heart failed him he lost his courage like a boy and it seemed to him that in this foreign inconceivable world they wanted to run after him to beat him to abuse him with foul words 
he tore down his coat from the peg and rushed headlong down the stairs part five pressing close to the fence he stood near to the house and waited for his friends to come out the sounds of the pianos and fiddles gay bold impudent and sad mingled into chaos in the air and this confusion was as before as if an unseen orchestra were tuning in the dark over the rooftops if he looked up towards the darkness then all the background was scattered with white moving points it was snowing the flakes coming into the light spun lazily in the air like feathers and still more lazily fell flakes of snow crowded whirling about vasiliev and hung on his beard his eyelashes his eyebrows the cabmen the horses and the passers-by all were white how dare the snow fall in this street thought vasiliev a curse on these houses because of his headlong rush down the staircase his feet failed him from weariness he was out of breath as if he had climbed a mountain his heart beat so loud that he could hear it a longing came over him to get out of this street as soon as possible and go home but still stronger was his desire to wait for his friends and to vent upon them his feeling of heaviness he had not understood many things in the houses the souls of the perishing women were to him a mystery as before but it was dear to him that the business was much worse than one would have thought if the guilty woman who poisoned herself was called a prostitute then it was hard to find a suitable name for all these creatures who danced to the muddling music and said long disgusting phrases they were not perishing they were already done for vice is here he thought but there is neither confession of sin nor hope of salvation they are bought and sold drowned in wine and torpor and they are dull and indifferent as sheep and do not understand my god my god it was so dear to him that all that which is called human dignity individuality the image and likeness of god was here dragged down to the gutter as they say of drunkards and that not only the street and the stupid women were to blame for it a crowd of students white with snow talking and laughing gaily passed by one of them a tall thin man peered into vasiliev's face and said drunkenly ah, he's one of ours logged old man aha my lad never mind walk up never say die uncle he took vasiliev by the shoulders and pressed his cold wet moustaches to his cheek then slipped staggered brandished his arms and cried out steady there don't fall laughing he ran to join his comrades through the noise the painter's voice became audible you dare beat women i won't have it go to hell you're a regular swine the medico appeared at the door of the house he glanced round and on seeing vasiliev said in alarm is that you my god it's simply impossible to go anywhere with yegor i can't understand a chap like that he kicked up a row can't you hear yegor he called from the door yegor i won't have you hitting women the painter's shrill voice was audible again from upstairs something heavy and bulky tumbled down the staircase it was the painter coming head over heels he had evidently been thrown out he lifted himself up from the ground dusted his hat and with an angry indignant face shook his fist at the upstairs scoundrels butchers bloodsuckers i won't have you hitting a weak drunken woman ah you jaeger jaeger the medico began to implore i give my word i'll never go out with you again upon my honour i won't the painter gradually calmed and the friends went home to these sad shores unknowing the medico began an unknown power entices behold the mill the painter sang with him after a pause now fallen into ruin how the snow is falling most holy mother why did you go away grisha you're a coward you're only an old woman vasiliev was walking behind his friends he stared at their backs and thought one of two things either prostitution only seems to us an evil and we exaggerate it 
or if prostitution is really such an evil as is commonly thought these charming friends of mine are just as much slavers violators and murderers as the inhabitants of syria and cairo whose photographs appear in the field they're singing laughing arguing soundly now but haven't they just been exploiting starvation ignorance and stupidity they have i saw them at it where does their humanity their science and their painting come in then the science art and lofty sentiments of these murderers remind me of the lump of fat in the story two robbers killed a beggar in a forest they began to divide his clothes between themselves and found in his bag a lump of pork fat in the nick of time said one of them let's have a bite how can you the other cried in terror have you forgotten today's friday so they refrained from eating after having cut the man's throat they walked out of the forest confident that they were pious fellows these two are just the same when they've paid for women they go and imagine they're painters and scholars listen you two he said angrily and sharply why do you go to those places can't you understand how horrible they are your medicine tells you every one of these women dies prematurely from consumption or something else your arts tell you that she died morally still earlier each of them dies because during her lifetime she accepts on an average let us say five hundred men each of them is killed by five hundred men and you're amongst the five hundred now if each of you comes here and to places like this two hundred and fifty times in his lifetime then it means that between you you have killed one woman can't you understand that isn't it horrible ah isn't this awful my god there i knew it would end like this said the painter frowning we oughtn't to have had anything to do with this fool of a blockhead i suppose you think your head's full of great thoughts and great ideas now devil knows what they are but they're not ideas you're staring at me now with hatred and disgust but if you want my opinion you'd better build twenty more of the houses than look like that there's more vice in your look than in the whole street let's clear out Velagia. damn him he's a fool he's a blockhead and that's all he is human beings are always killing each other said the medico that is immoral of course but philosophy won't help you good-bye the friends departed at trubnoi square and went their way left alone vassiliev began to stride along the boulevard he was frightened of the dark frightened of the snow which fell to the earth in little flakes but seemed to long to cover the whole world he was frightened of the street lamps which glimmered faintly through the clouds of snow an inexplicable faint-hearted fear possessed his soul now and then people passed him but he gave a start and stepped aside it seemed to him that from somewhere there came and stared at him women only women it's coming on he thought i'm going to have a fit part six at home he lay on his bed and began to talk shivering all over his body live women live oh my god they're alive he sharpened the edge of his imagination in every possible way now he was the brother of an unfortunate now her father now he was himself a fallen woman with painted cheeks and all this terrified him it seemed to him somehow that he must solve this question immediately at all costs and that the problem was not strange to him but was his own he made a great effort conquered his despair and sitting on the side of the bed his head clutched in his hands he began to think how could all the women he had seen that night be saved the process of solving a problem was familiar to him as to a learned person and notwithstanding all his excitement he kept strictly to this process he recalled to mind the history of the question its literature and just after three o'clock he was pacing up and down trying to remember all the experiments which are practised nowadays for the salvation of women he had a great many good friends who lived in furnished rooms Falsfein, Galishkin, Netschaif, Yeshkin, not a few among them were honest and self-sacrificing, and some of them had attempted to save these women. All these few attempts, thought Vassiliev, rare attempts, may be divided into three groups. 
some having rescued a woman from a brothel hired a room for her bought her a sewing machine and she became a dressmaker and the man who saved her kept her for his mistress openly or otherwise but later when he had finished his studies and was going away he would hand her over to another decent fellow so the fallen woman remained fallen others having bought her out also hired a room for her bought the inevitable sewing machine and started her off reading and writing and preached at her the woman sits and sews as long as it is novel and amusing but later when she is bored she begins to receive men secretly or runs back to where she can sleep till three in the afternoon drink coffee and eat till she is full finally the most ardent and self-sacrificing take a bold determined step they marry and when the impudent self-indulgent stupefied creature becomes a wife a lady of the house and then a mother her life and outlook are utterly changed and in the wife and mother it is hard to recognize the unfortunate woman yes marriage is the best it may be the only resource but it's impossible vassiliev said aloud and threw himself down on his bed first of all i could not marry one one would have to be a saint to be able to do it unable to hate not knowing disgust but let us suppose that the painter the medico and i got the better of our feelings and married that all these women got married what is the result what kind of effect follows the result is that while the women get married here in moscow the smolensk bookkeeper seduces a fresh lot and these will pour into the empty places together with women from saratov nizhny novgorod warsaw and what happens to the hundred thousand in london what can be done with those in hamburg the oil in the lamp was used up and the lamp began to smell vassiliev did not notice it again he began to pace up and down thinking now he put the question differently what can be done to remove the demand for fallen women for this it is necessary that the men who buy and kill them should at once begin to feel all the immorality of their role of slave owners and this should terrify them it is necessary to save the men science and art apparently won't do thought vassiliev there is only one way out to be an apostle and he began to dream how he would stand to-morrow evening at the corner of the street and say to each passer-by where are you going and what for fear god he would turn to the indifferent cabmen and say to them why are you standing here why don't you revolt you do believe in god don't you you do know that this is a crime and that people will go to hell for this why do you keep quiet then true the women are strangers to you but they have fathers and brothers exactly the same as you some friend of vassiliev's once said of him that he was a man of talent there is a talent for writing for the theatre for painting but vassiliev's was peculiar a talent for humanity he had a fine and noble flair for every kind of suffering as a good actor reflects in himself the movement and voice of another so vassiliev could reflect in himself another's pain seeing tears he wept with a sick person he himself became sick and moaned if he saw violence done it seemed to him that he was the victim he was frightened like a child and frightened ran for help another's pain roused him excited him threw him into a state of ecstasy whether the friend was right i do not know but what happened to vassiliev when it seemed to him that the question was solved was very much like an ecstasy he sobbed laughed said aloud the things he would say to-morrow felt a burning love for the men who would listen to him and stand by his side at the corner of the street preaching he sat down to write to them he made vows all this was the more like an ecstasy in that it did not last vassiliev was soon tired the london women the hamburg women those from warsaw crushed him with their mass as the mountains crush the earth he quailed before this mass 
he lost himself he remembered he had no gift for speaking that he was timid and faint-hearted that strange people would hardly want to listen to and understand him a law student in his third year a frightened and insignificant figure the true apostleship consisted not only in preaching but also in deeds when daylight came and the carts rattled on the streets vassiliev lay motionless on the sofa staring at one point he did not think any more of women or men or apostles all his attention was fixed on the pain in his soul which tormented him it was a dull pain indefinite vague it was like anguish and the most acute fear and despair he could say where the pain was it was in his breast under the heart it could not be compared to anything once on a time he used to have a violent toothache once he had pleurisy and neuralgia but all these pains were as nothing beside the pain of his soul beneath this pain life seemed repulsive the thesis his brilliant work already written the people he loved the salvation of fallen women all that which only yesterday he loved or was indifferent to remembered now irritated him in the same way as the noise of the carts the running about of the porters and the daylight if some one now were to perform before his eyes a deed of mercy or an act of revolting violence both would produce upon him an equally repulsive impression of all the thoughts which roved lazily in his head two only did not irritate him one at any moment he had the power to kill himself the other that the pain would not last more than three days the second he knew from experience after having lain down for a while he got up and walked wringing his hands not from corner to corner as usually but in a square along the walls he caught a glimpse of himself in the glass his face was pale and haggard his temples hollow his eyes bigger darker more immobile as if they were not his own and they expressed the intolerable suffering of his soul in the afternoon the painter knocked at the door gregory are you at home he asked receiving no answer he stood musing for a while and said to himself good-naturedly out he's gone to the university damn him and went away vassiliev lay down on his bed and burying his head in the pillow he began to cry with the pain but the faster his tears flowed the more terrible was the pain when it was dark he got into his mind the idea of the horrible night which was awaiting him and awful despair seized him he dressed quickly ran out of his room leaving the door wide open and into the street without reason or purpose without asking himself where he was going he walked quickly to sadovia street snow was falling as yesterday it was thawing putting his hands into his sleeves shivering and frightened of the noises and the bells of the trams and of passers-by vassiliev walked from sadovai to sukarev tower then to the red gates and from here he turned and went to basmanya he went into a public-house and gulped down a big glass of vodka but felt no better arriving at razgulyai he turned to the right and began to stride down streets that he had never in his life been down before he came to that old bridge under which the river yotsa roars and from whence long rows of lights are seen in the windows of the red barracks in order to distract the pain of his soul by a new sensation or another pain not knowing what to do weeping and trembling vassiliev unbuttoned his coat and jacket bared his naked breast to the damp snow and the wind neither lessened the pain then he bent over the rail of the bridge and stared down at the black turbulent yauza and he suddenly wanted to throw himself head first not from hatred of life not for the sake of suicide but only to hurt himself and so to kill one pain by another but the black water the dark deserted banks covered with snow were frightening he shuddered and went on he walked as far as the red barracks then back and into a wood from the wood to the bridge again no home home he thought at home i believe it's easier 
and he went back on returning home he tore off his wet clothes and hat began to pace along the walls and paced incessantly until the very morning part seven the next morning when the painter and the medico came to see him they found him in a shirt torn to ribbons his hands bitten all over tossed about in the room and moaning with pain for god's sake he began to sob seeing his comrades take me anywhere you like do what you like but save me for god's sake now now i'll kill myself the painter went pale and was bewildered the medico too nearly began to cry but believing that medical men must be cool and serious on every occasion of life he said coldly it's a fit you've got but never mind come to the doctor at once anywhere you like but quickly for god's sake don't be agitated you must struggle with yourself the painter and the medico dressed vasiliev with trembling hands and led him into the street mikhail sergoyevich has been wanting to make your acquaintance for a long while the medico said on the way he's a very nice man and knows his job splendidly he took his degree in eighty two and has got a huge practice already he keeps friends with the students quicker quicker urged vasiliev mikhail sergeyevich a stout doctor with fair hair received the friends politely firmly coldly and smiled with one cheek only the painter and meyer have told me of your disease already he said very glad to be of service to you well sit down please he made vasiliev sit down in a large chair by the table and put a box of cigarettes in front of him well he began stroking his knees let's make a start how old are you he put questions and the medico answered he asked whether vasiliev's father suffered from any peculiar diseases if he had fits of drinking was he distinguished by his severity or any other eccentricities he asked the same questions about his grandfather mother sisters and brothers having ascertained that his mother had a fine voice and occasionally appeared on the stage he suddenly brightened up and asked excuse me but could you recall whether the theatre was not a passion with your mother about twenty minutes passed vasiliev was bored by the doctor stroking his knees and talking of the same thing all the while as far as i can remember your questions doctor he said you want to know whether my disease is hereditary or not it is not hereditary the doctor went on to ask if vasiliev had not any secret vices in his early youth any blows on the head any love passions eccentricities or exceptional infatuations to half the questions habitually asked by careful doctors you may return no answer without any injury to your health but mikhail sergoyevich uh, the medico and the painter looked as though if vasiliev failed to answer even one single question everything would be ruined for some reason the doctor wrote down the answers he received on a scrap of paper discovering that vasiliev had already passed through the faculty of natural science and was now in the law faculty the doctor began to be pensive he wrote a brilliant thesis last year said the medico excuse me you mustn't interrupt me you prevent me from concentrating the doctor said smiling with one cheek yes certainly that is important for the anamnesis yes uh, yes uh, do you drink vodka he turned to vasiliev very rarely another twenty minutes passed the medico began sotto voce to give his opinion of the immediate causes of the fit and told how he the painter and vasiliev went to s street the day before yesterday the indifferent reserved cold tone in which his friends and the doctor were speaking of the women and the miserable street seemed to him in the highest degree strange doctor tell me this one thing he said restraining himself from being rude is prostitution an evil or not my dear fellow who disputes it the doctor said with an expression as though he had long ago solved all these questions for himself who disputes it are you a psychiatrist yes a, a psychiatrist 
perhaps all of you are right said vassiliev rising and beginning to walk from corner to corner it may be but to me all this seems amazing they see a great achievement in my having passed through two faculties at the university they praise me to the skies because i've written a work that will be thrown away and forgotten in three years time but because i can't speak of prostitutes as indifferently as i can about these chairs they send me to doctors call me a lunatic and pity me for some reason vassiliev suddenly began to feel an intolerable pity for himself his friends and everybody whom he had seen the day before yesterday and for the doctor he began to sob and fell into the chair the friends looked interrogatively at the doctor he looking as though he magnificently understood the tears and the despair and knew himself a specialist in this line approached vassiliev and gave him some drops to drink and then when vassiliev grew calm undressed him and began to examine the sensitiveness of his skin of the knee reflexes and vassiliev felt better when he was coming out of the doctor's he was already ashamed the noise of the traffic did not seem irritating and the heaviness beneath his heart became easier and easier as though it were thawing in his hand were two prescriptions one was for cali bromatum, the other morphia he used to take both before he stood still in the street for a while pensive and then taking leave of his friends lazily dragged on towards the university End of story three.